ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. For author and home cook Charlotte Ree, food is entangled in some of the most important moments of her life. All the way from childhood to adulthood, marriage, the perils of online dating and from breakups to a long-awaited sense of self. Charlotte has a really lovely passage in the book where she talks about the way that heat can change things in cooking, but it can change people too when it seems there's no way out. Charlotte's book is called Heart Bake, a Bittersweet Memoir. Hello, Charlotte. Hello. Charlotte, at the start of your book, there is a a beautiful photo of you Mm. as a little girl with your mum. Your mum's sitting on a step and you're leaning into her and she's she's kissing you on on the forehead what goes through your mind when you see that photo it's like i've just put my whole weight on her and she's holding me and it's it's literally the one thing i would save in a fire it's the only printed photo i have of the two of us and as um, my childhood sort of developed and into adulthood, it's it's kind of like one of very few photos I actually have with my mum. She's averse to them. So it's so special because it just, it sums us up. It's her holding me and she's she's always done that. And there's a lovely thing too that you've, you've kind of got your arms limp at your exactly. sides. You're falling completely into yeah. your mum, this feeling of sort of safety it yeah, looks like. Yeah, mm. completely. And I mean, I have to say she'll love that you've started this interview with asking <laughs> about her because she's quite selfishly <laughs> being concerned about her presence in media. <laughs> you, you say in the book that your mum would breathe you in when she hugged you. What, mm. what do you mean by that? Oh, she, my mum is a voluptuous woman. She's larger than life. And I feel like hugging her is just being completely enveloped and completely seen. I could have the weight of the world and she could lift it off of me. And she does that, you know, she lives on the mid-north coast and I'm in Sydney. She does that just with a text sometimes, just a call. It's not even the physical presence. It's just the knowing that she's there and she's just been that kind of all, um, all-encompassing all mum. Your mum's parents separated when she was 12. What sort of effect did that have on her life? What did people start noticing about her behaviour and the way she was seeing the world? Yeah, I think that, you know, for any child that's experienced that, it is a it can be quite traumatic and it can be a, quite a, a circumstance of big change. And I guess around that time, Um, people started to notice different behaviours that my mum had uh, and what resulted was a a subsequent diagnosis of schizoaffective bipolar disorder. What does that mean? Uh, It means for mum, it's different for every person, but it means for mum that she hears voices at times. Um, She doesn't get the depressive side of bipolar. She gets the mania. So it's lack of sleep. It's um, very high libido. It's uh, excessive spending. But as a child for her, navigating that um, in a small country town, I think that would have been incredibly difficult and even more difficult when she fell pregnant at 17 with my brother. So she had your brother very young. Incredibly young. And at that point in time, you know, my my grandmother desperately wanted him to be christened and the country priest was against a mother out of wedlock at that time. There was so much shame around it. And I think that's probably a big theme throughout my life and her life is shame that's attached to things that there just shouldn't be. There was just a lack of understanding and a lack of acceptance. And I I wish that wasn't the case, but it certainly made both of us who we are. For you, Charlotte, as as a small kid, what did all that look like to you if if mum was caught up in that cycle of, of mania or there were things were going on? What yeah. did that look like for you? I mean, it made me grow up very quickly and it basically compelled me to be as small as possible. And I mean that in the sense that I didn't want to rock the boat that was already a little bit rocky. I wanted to be um, what other, I envisaged other people wanted me to be. My parents and my family certainly never had those expectations of me, but it meant that I wanted to be the perfect child and I wanted to um, people please 
in every sense of the word. It was hard because it was not something that I found I was able to talk about and particularly hard going into teenage um, hood where people would call my mum crazy. Uh, and for my mum it was hard too. You know, there have been so many moments in my life where she said to me, don't you just wish that you had a normal mummy? But all of the mums, my friends' mums, were so much older and so much more boring. I couldn't have wished for anything less. It, it, my mum is my mum and she is who she is because of her mental illness. It makes her be this incredible, creative, colourful, wonderful, eccentric human being. That's not to say that there are times when her illness, um, you know, certainly was a thief that took her away when I wanted or needed her the most, but she always came back. And even when she was at her most sick, she was still there, but there was just a fog of medication that kind of clouded it. You were talking about not rocking the boat. What would you yeah. actually do to, if you could feel some of that coming on as a small kid, what would you do to try and Yeah, I mean, small? the simplest way to put it is like my mum is absolutely allergic to any form of organisation. And so <laughs> I would be at like six or seven, like organising the family, like routine and, and making sure, you know, that this was when this had to happen. And this is from a really young age, which later in life explains my career as a, as a publicist, organising people's lives within an inch of their lives. But my mum hates it even now, you know, she'll be, a, she's so spontaneous. And I can remember as a kid, she was like, we're going to go see our friends. And they were a six-hour drive away. And so we got in the car and we drove, but the friends weren't home because mum hadn't told them that we were coming. Like that's the perfect example of, of something that she would do. Uh, and that then made me just be so militant in terms of my like, right, we're planning, we're organising, this is what we're doing. Um, and that I would say is probably the biggest one is that I would organise my family within an inch of their lives because no one else would. When did you get a sense of going to your friends' houses that things might have been a little bit different at your <laughs> yeah. place? There was one particular friend, and I think when you're little, you know, I idolised her. Her name was Hannah, and I grew up on the Northern Rivers and would go to her house, and I remember she had all of her clothes on hangers and all neatly fo like folded. <laughs> what and, are these strange things? And organised, exactly. <laughs> and her mum was like this Stepford housewife. The house was spotless. She would bake for us and she would, you know, each day after school there would be like certain treats that she had homemade. Whereas for us, like, our clean clothes were in the bathtub and you would sift through it with your hands to try to find a clean uniform that day. And my mum never cooked. My pa, my stepdad, um, who's been there since I was, I was two, was the sort of the mum of the household. And I remember I must have come home from one of uh, my visits at Hannah's and it would have been awful because I would have been in just devastating detail about how incredible this home-cooked meal was. And my mum the next day... We got back, my brother and I, from school and mum was dishevelled. She was covered in flour. The kitchen was a mess. But sitting there on the countertop were baked banana muffins. And I just remember that was probably the first time I ever really connected food with feeling. And it was the feeling like my mum had heard me talk about Hannah's mum's baking and she had baked for me. The difference was that my brother, who's severely dyslexic, then went to the bin and he was like, hey, Bub, is, is that the Woolies logo? And it was a muffin um, tin and she'd bought store-bought muffins but then pretended that she'd baked them. Uh, it's an incredibly generous act, though, it from is. your mum to It you. was extraordinary. Mm. It was basically, you know, I can imagine it was hurtful when I sort of came home and, and projected that longing and that desire. And I think so much of of that childhood for me was um, being envious of kids that had their parents still together or had siblings that had the same dad, whereas I would be that kid that was like, well, I've got this half-brother here and then these step-siblings here and then these other three half-siblings here. And actually now in, in adulthood I can go, oh, my God, how lucky that you had this motley crew and this curdled family of a way because it's made me who I am. It, it sounds like there was a lot of richness there for you as well, Charlotte. Your your mum gave you and your brother a heart song when you yeah. were born. What What's a heart song? A heart song is basically a, a baby song in a lot of ways and, and mine was Dream a Little Dream of Me by Mama Cass. And even now if I'm 
really distressed or sick and want to self-soothe, I'll sing that to myself. And I have audio recordings of my mum singing it to me too. And my brother's is summertime. And it's just, you know, so much of my childhood was just full of demonstrative love. It was affection. It was hugging. It was, they were feeders. Oh my God, were they feeders. <laughs> like I remember taking my boyfriend at the time to visit my grandparents and they live on a farm and and uh, Nen had made her casserole and I was so excited. And my boyfriend who then became my husband was in restaurants. And so I was like, Nen, what's in your casserole? And she was like, one pack of French onion soup, one pack of curry powder. <laughs> you know, it was just keeping it real. really, yeah, really <laughs> rustic. When you were becoming a, a teenager, were, were there any worries for you, Charlotte, that your mum's mental health might also be your mental health in the future? Absolutely. And I, I think I still have moments of that fear. You know, a, a lot of that is because there's so much stigma attached to mental health, which I hate. It was the, the fears that I had as a, as a kid were absolutely from the projections of people around me. And I remember going to mum once and saying, you know, do you think do you think that I could catch catch it? A friend had said, do you think you could catch it? And I was like, what, like a cold? You know, and I went to my mum and she was like, you've got your own stuff, but you don't have what I have. <laughs> Everyone has something. How important were, you, were your grandparents as an anchor with all of this going on? Crucial. Nan, you know, would come, there were instances where mum would go into a mental health um, inpatient clinic. Nan would come and help Pa and, and look after us. And and again, that's where food is so intrinsic for me. Like so much of that was ritual of like she baking. She could show her care for you. Yeah, of mm. baking with Nan. And even now if I taste butter and sugar that's been beaten together, I'm back there with her in that safety net. They had this beautiful, safe space for us to retreat to. It was, you know, always a full pantry with Kingston biscuits and always just so much love, even in the absence of, of mum when she wasn't well. Was it frightening for you as a kid when mum would go away? It was just this loss. Like it was a grief more than being frightened. Like mum would never do anything sort of scary in that way. I mean, there were instances where she, as part of, you know, hearing different things, would envisage that she was Mary Magdalene and so she would wash our feet and paint my pa's toenails and there'd be those kind of rituals. There'd be moments where, you know, growing up in a small town like Lismore and um, Lismore Shopping Square was like, you know, the Westfield, the mass, you know, where you'd go and you'd see everyone. And I remember she once had put on one of my T-shirts and I would have been, you know, quite a tiny um, flat-chested teenager, but my mum was a voluptuous woman with massive breasts and it barely fit over one nipple. And she was saying, well, I'm going to go to Lismore Shopping Square now. And it was trying to kind of rein in those parts. There was um, humour in it, if, you know, because I think so much of what we did, if you didn't laugh, you'd cry. There was never any shame at that point of what you know, the illness was, it was just part of our lives and it was learning to live with that and appreciate it because it does make mum who she is and she says, you know, when she takes lithium that it, it dulls her and it's unfortunate that that's what's needed to keep her at that sort of regular level. Charlotte, after a stint at uni, you get a job as a book publicist and you meet your future husband at the home of romance, the Courthouse Hotel <laughs> yeah. in Newtown. Yeah. What drew you to this man? I had known of him through mutual friends. It was, I'm, mum always says that as a child, I drew men with moustaches whenever I drew men <laughs> in pictures and he had this glorious moustache. And I just immediately felt endeared to him. The best way to describe him um, is that he's like a beautiful big puppy dog. He's just happy and, and buoyant and joyous and I really loved that. You cook spaghetti bolognese, one of your signature dishes for him, from scratch on your second date. It's interesting how food and, and yeah. companionship and love are intertwining. Well, he made it for me. I mean, when I moved to Sydney, again, just coming from the country, I could make like meat and three veg, meat and three veg, tacos from a packet, bolognese from a jar. And he came to our share house that had one working element and he showed me how to make bolognese from scratch, like a 24-hour kind of ritual. It was meditative and it was seeing food through the eyes of a real food lover. And he could, I was always so jealous, he could open up a fridge and no matter what ingredients were in it, he could make something from it. And I thought that is the greatest life skill anyone could have. 
You, you went overseas together and a few months later, then your boyfriend moved out and flew to Europe. You broke up and then you got back together again mm. and moved back in together. Yeah. What was your sense of the relationship then? It had changed. I, you know, one of the big reasons for the breakup was that we'd met at 19, which is an incredibly young age young. to meet someone and be mm. in a serious relationship. And by that point, which is around um, 25 years old, he wanted to sleep with other people. And I think a lot of that was to do with us being the mum and dad of the group, so to speak. No one else was in serious relationships. I think boys kind of have that bravado about them in, in a particular way of conquesting and different things that they need to do. And so for me, I was so hurt that... Um, it's feeding into that sense that I wasn't enough, that I wasn't lovable, that um, I wasn't worthy of just being the sole object of someone's love and desire and attention. And so there had been a shift. But I suppose I'm a hopeless romantic at heart. I love love more than anything. And I just really loved him and I really believed in us and believed in the relationship. So one night you and your boyfriend were playing hangman of all things <laughs> um, on the chalkboard in the, the house that you're in. What did you spell out for him? What was there waiting for him once I, he could I figure it out? hanged man him, will you marry me? Which he said aloud straight away. And I went, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll marry you. And so he technically had asked, even though I had propositioned it. And I suppose for me, I talking about being the planner and, and the organiser from a young age, it was an idea of a life for myself that I had mapped out in my head, that I'd be in a serious relationship in my early 20s, and I was, that I'd be in a serious position at my company by that same time, and I was, and then, of course, that I would get married by a particular age. And so did I force his hand? Yes. Do I regret that? No. I absolutely don't regret any part of our relationship. Did you feel sure? No, would be the, the honest answer. And I don't think either of us did. But part of that for me was that I really wanted to give it my all and to give us our, our all. When did money start becoming an issue in the relationship? Before um, we got married, um, he kind of agreed to it on two conditions. And the first was that I would get my licence uh, which at 32, I can say I just did. But the other was that we would join our bank accounts. And I went into that really naively and, again, hopeless romantic. I was like, yeah, you want to do that? Absolutely. My mum was adamant that I never did that. And she's been with my pa now for 30 plus years and they don't share bank accounts still. And, and you were the main breadwinner for, for the couple. Yeah, I was. And I guess, you know, I'd been at my company by that point for almost seven years. I've now been there for 13. And he, I think, really struggled with knowing what he wanted to do. Ambition and drive were very different things for us. And I suppose I had that in spades and I guess he was a little bit lost. What did it mean in day-to-day -day life if you're wanting to buy things or buy things for yourself? Yeah. How did that play out? So we had the joint bank account and so all of our sort of everyday expenses like food and groceries and um, but they were always from Aldi, could never be from anywhere else unless it was um, agreed upon or phone bills and all of those sorts of things were from the joint account. But if I wanted to go out for dinner with a girlfriend, if I had been out late and needed to get an Uber home, it all came from an allowance of $100 a week that I was given. We were both given the same allowance, um, but if that money was spent, there was no additional money. And if there was a request for additional money, it was, it was a huge argument. I knew that it wasn't right. But I had so much shame around the fact that, oh, me as an independent, intelligent woman in the 21st century in Australia had found myself in that situation. I couldn't get my head around it and I certainly didn't feel like I could talk to anybody about it. At one stage you wanted to buy a new bra. What happened? Um, we never argued and I genuinely mean that. We then only argued about money. It was so toxic and so taxing and I remember I needed new bras and I have big breasts and I can't just go and get something off a rack you know that was an argument that I had had with him that I needed more than my $100 to do it and he said that I couldn't. How did that sense extend to food not just to money? Basically I would say it extended to food and sex I think we both were in elements of trying to control 
things in an uncontrollable situation. For me, I withheld sex because I didn't feel like having sex at that point in time. And in food too, I mean, the kitchen was his domain. He kind of ruled the roost in that way and I didn't feel as though I had any control or any confidence. Confidence would be the big one as part of all, everything that was happening with money and in our relationship at that time, I was consumed by anxiety and as a result was fueled by indecision. And I don't mean on big things. I mean like what did I want to wear that day or what was I going to have for lunch that day? I couldn't make even basic decisions. Why did you decide to end the marriage? Yeah, and that was the biggest decision of all. And, you know, some people talk about there being a moment and there certainly was for me. And we had done couples counselling for about a year and I didn't feel like we were getting anywhere. It was it was too people and I and I really mean this it was controlling and financial control but he was not and is not a malicious person we had very different goals and very different desires and his was he really wanted to buy a house I wanted to do that eventually but I didn't want to have to forgo basic enjoyment in the meantime but we were um I started doing some extra work and we were out on a on a sort of event on a boat for a a job that I'd just done for a company. And I remember I'd gotten a bonus at work and my long service leave was coming up and I really wanted to go to Paris and I really wanted to do a sabbatical. And I told him and he kind of just tapped me on the shoulder and he said, well, I'd really love you to have Paris. You know that, don't you? But it just all has to go into our savings. And I don't know how to explain it, but it was like a lightning shock ran through me and I just knew in that moment that I had to leave And a lot of that was to do with the fact that I was so scared of who I would become if I stayed. You moved into a new house on your own. What happened to your relationship with food in that solitude? Yeah. Uh, So I moved out and I moved into um, a new suburb. I moved into Newtown. But the significant thing that happened was that um, the next day after I moved, Sydney went into its first lockdown. And so all of these sort of Um, And I can't even say it was confidence because even the day that I moved, I was still thinking, oh, you can go back and it wasn't that bad. But I had a a life at that point that was devoid of of colour and taste. I had no appetite. I was at rock bottom and it was bleak. I felt an immense amount of failure from ending the marriage. I felt shame about ending the marriage. And to do it at a time when the world was shutting down around me, I couldn't travel and distract myself with work. I couldn't distract myself by going out with friends or having friends over. It was me alone in a three-storey terrace with just my very toxic self-talk and my very depressive state at that point in time. What were you eating then? I wasn't eating anything and I remember I hadn't told anyone um, about the divorce mostly because my mum had had her first episode in over a decade. And when I finally told my mum, I think by that point I'd lost about 10 kilos. And that was also, you know, the benefit but detriment of lockdown was that no one was seeing me. So it wasn't like anyone was holding me accountable. And my mum said to me, still kind of in a fog of the new drugs she was on, Bubby, you have to, you know, see this like an elephant and you have to take one bite out of it at a time. So pick one thing that you can eat. And that ended up being boiled eggs, hard boiled eggs. And I ate one boiled egg a day. That's all? That's all. So you're in lockdown. You're on your own. Why did you start cooking for your neighbours? I grew up in the country And I just kept thinking about what my grandparents did. And I, you know, I moved to Sydney when I was 17. I avoided my neighbours. We had house parties. You know, we were obnoxious. (laughs) And here I was, I'd moved into this new suburb. My friends weren't living in my local area. And I just remember thinking to myself, the one way you can pull yourself out of this is to learn to cook. And you don't want to waste the food, so you need to feed someone. And I remember I took copies of my first cookbook, Just Desserts, and I baked banana muffins. And I would have looked 
deranged and unhinged, <laughs> like someone who has not slept and has not stopped crying and has lost a lot of weight uh, for weeks. And I went and knocked on the immediate kind of hug of the houses that were around my house. And I knocked on their door and I said, hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm going through a divorce. Please let me cook for you. I'm not going to poison you. I'm legit. Here's a cookbook I've published. Um, just let me feed you. Well, what reaction did you get from them? It was um, it was delightful. It was so surprising. And I think that's because the woman next door um, was living alone, doing her PhD. Beside her was another woman, a single mum, who had just um, become redundant. Across the road were essential workers. There was a bloke across the other side of the street that had always lived alone. It was as though it was something we all needed but didn't know that we did until it started happening. It must have been wonderful on those days. When you set yourself a day where you're just going to be in the kitchen, I usually throw some music on yeah, as well. It's I beautiful, isn't it? I have the same it? playlist of 60s love songs, you know, Aretha <laughs> and Marvin. And, and it is. It becomes a ritual and it becomes a part of a routine that is so nourishing and nurturing. How important was it for you to, to connect with your neighbours around you? It was crucial. And I think a lot of that was feeling less alone and feeling like there was someone there to watch out for me. And, you know, there were moments where um, they would just come and knock on my door and check on me if they hadn't seen me leave the house <laughs> for a couple of days. They'd bring me herbs from the community garden. It was like someone was saying, I don't really know you, but I know what you're going through and I'm here if you need me. This is Conversations with Sally Sara. You can follow Conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. Charlotte, lockdown is still underway in mid-2020 and you make the big decision to launch yourself into the world of online dating. You describe it in the book as a, a phase of self-sabotage. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I'd never been on the apps before. I'd had friends that did it, but, you know, I would say it was self-sabotage for a people pleaser who still had no idea who they were to enter that world where you can so quickly be rejected, where you can so quickly be dismissed, where you are basically summed up in six photographs and, you know, 200 characters of who you are. For me, that was the ultimate form of self-sabotage. Even worse than that was when I did start to date and I invited those men into my home after much stalking, I must say. But I knew, you know, where they worked and who they were and, and what their profiles were. But by cooking for them, and I don't just mean cooking, I would make three or four course meals. I felt like them loving my food meant that they were loving me. And that's absolutely not the case. Was it exciting or scary kind of launching off into this new world? I think I had an air of confidence about me. And a lot of that was performative. It was me saying like, look at what I've been through, but look at this house that I have and look at how great a cook I am. And so much about who I am now is none of those things. So it wasn't scary in that way, but I suppose there was a flutter of nerves in just wanting to be liked and wanting to be shape-shifting, I suppose is the best way to describe it, myself into being who that person needed me to be or who I thought they wanted me to be. You matched on one of the dating apps uh, with a bloke who you've now nicknamed The Fright. Yeah. We'll find out why in a moment. Yeah. Um, what, what was the first date like? The first date was great. You know, I met him in Newtown and we went to my local wine bar, which I love to go to for dates. And the conversation was brilliant. Uh, he was engaging. And by that point, I suppose I had realised that I could actually end it at a reasonable point and go home. But also I realised kind of partway through that date that he was, and I love wine, but he was probably drinking two to my one and I thought, oh, it's probably time to call it and go home now because I didn't want to get drunk and didn't want to do anything I might regret. So you, you went home uh, on your own. Mm -hmm. What happened? As I was walking home and it was about a 10-minute walk, the bar from my house, I got a text um, from him saying that he loved me. I was immediately shaken and I got into a taxi straight away. And after one day? After one, mm. two hours, two hours together. 
And what then occurred was a night of harassment. What sort of text messages was he sending you? He was sending me messages saying that he loved me, that he wanted to be with me, that he felt like I was the one and that I had gone and ruined it. He was telling me that he was going to kill himself. It was all sort of attention-seeking in a way that was someone desperate at that point. And I think a lot of people who have read the book or who could hear me say this are saying, well, why didn't you block him and why didn't you report him? The problem with the apps is that you can report somebody, but there's no sort of way to stop that person from creating another profile. The problem with sharing numbers, of course, I could have blocked him, but I come from a childhood with both parents that have mental illness. And for me, someone saying that they are at that point is not a point for me where I go, I'm going to block you. So I would reply with the numbers for Lifeline. I would reply by telling him that he wasn't alone, that he had family and friends that he could lean on. And a lot of, I think, what was happening was alcohol fueled Mm -hmm. for him. Physically, what's your reaction as these texts are pinging and pinging on your phone? Horrific. Absolute nausea and anxiety. And again, I just didn't know who I could call or who I could talk to because it was totally unexplained situation that I'd never been in before. It sounds really scary. Yeah, it was awful and I didn't, you know, I couldn't sleep. I slept in the front room so I could hear the gate if it went off. You know, it was um, a hypervigilant state of absolute anxiety. So you were worried he could come to your house? Yeah, I was really worried that we'd met so close to my house that he might be able to find it. In one of the messages he claimed to be in hospital, was that real? I don't believe so. I don't believe that any of it was real. And, you know, it kind of the big escalation was waking up to a message from a different number with someone claiming to be his sister saying that he had passed away. And that wasn't the case? No. I woke up and I read that and I immediately thought, oh, my God, this, like, this is so distressing. And then I thought, oh, no, it's you. And at that point, I remembered a friend came to see me and when they opened, when I opened the door, they just knew something was wrong. And I told them and we ended up calling the number from a private um, number and he answered within two rings. What did you think about that? That that was someone who was incredibly unwell. And as much as I could sort of separate that and separate what he was doing from me, it still impacted me so heavily and also again just I think we had had a conversation about my childhood and and mental illness and so for him to know that and to use that was so devastating and so traumatic. For young women in particular on those apps that's the worst nightmare isn't it? It is Mm -hmm. and I part of the reason why I included that in the book is because no one really talks about this. No one really talks about it until it goes so far that it makes news headlines for a really devastating reason. I think the apps is an incredibly toxic place to be. And now finding myself, you know, single, it's like, well, what do I want to do? And I certainly don't want to go on the apps again, that's for sure. Charlotte, about a year after you left your husband, your beautiful grandma died. How much did she mean to you? So much. You know, I the benefit of having a, a mother who had teenage pregnancies, and I'm the first in four generations not to have a teenage pregnancy, was that I have known both sets of my great-grandparents and both sets of my grandparents. And I'm incredibly fortunate in that way. And I still have three grandparents alive today. But losing her was like my first time as an adult of experiencing grief And the grief of a woman that I had so deeply connected with and and connected with on food. She's the first person to ever take me overseas. And I think it was just that sense of of grief and loss uh, that you can't really prepare for until you experience it. She was at your your birth as well. Yeah, she she came That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. She's known you since the she knew you from the very beginning. Yeah, and I'm I'm she met me before my dad did. Yeah. What was the funeral like for your grandmother? It was so re, I would say, in the (laughs) sense that, you know, it was an open-air cathedral on the mid-north coast. Uh, She was in a wicker coffin 
And instead of having flowers on the coffin, there were fruit and vegetables. Produce to the end. (laughs) Produce. And, you know, that was so them. And it made me, you know, she used to take picnic baskets with egg sandwiches when we went to the zoo and things like that. (laughs) And I remember, you know, after the funeral, we went to our sort of family, have a holiday house in Foster. And we went there and the bouquet of, of fruit and veg was no longer full of fruit and veg, but it was sitting on the countertop and everyone was digging into this bowl of food. And I remember looking at my auntie and then looking at this crock pot and it had been repurposed into minestrone. And I just love that because that's so re too, is that you make the most of everything that you have. What do you think is the most important thing that your nan taught you? It's not even about teaching, but it's like this instilled joy of food and she had this audible reaction to when she ate something (laughs) she'd go "Mm," like that and it could have been eating bread with jam or it could have been eating the most incredible um, roast meal for instance but now if I hear someone have an audible enjoyment of food (laughs) she is sitting right beside me you received the divorce papers and then on the the Easter weekend you started feeling chest pains. What was happening? So it was Easter. It was my first Easter because in leaving my marriage, I also left my family in a way. And so I was alone. My friends weren't in town and my parents were up north and I started having chest pains. And initially they were just kind of like a flutter and then they became like a scream. And so I took myself to the emergency at St. Vincent's and got seen straight away and there were murmurs on the ECG. And then this beautiful young doctor came and and sat with me. They did all of the tests and she asked me about what was going on in my life and I told her and I realised that I'd had a panic attack for the first time. I've never experienced one of those attacks. Can you take me inside and give me a sense of what it's like when that... People say it feels like they're actually dying. I honestly felt like that. It was... Mm. And the best way to describe it is it's it's fight or flight. It's the parasympathetic nervous system. It's basically your body not being able to distinguish between being chased by a bear or a bee buzzing around you. And so your body just goes into absolute trauma response. And I had never experienced anything like that before. And so for me, it was just this yeah, sensation that my body was shutting down and that I was dying. And it's the profound connection between the body and the brain. It is inexplicable. Why do you think it happened then? I think it was the brutality of of just receiving this email out of the blue, which was, you know, that the divorce papers had arrived and the clinical nature of it was brutal. And nothing can prepare you for them. And I found myself sitting in this new apartment I'd moved into alone at Easter. You know, there was so much sadness and a lot of sadness for myself. So in those kind of absolute low points, there's an intersection, there's a choice about what you're going to do. What did you decide to do? To absolutely do everything I could to find joy. And for me, that came in realising that I didn't have to cook for other people to be loved. I actually could take time on my own and make time intensive dishes for myself. And that included, you know, spending three days making tortellini in brodo and hand folding 500 individual tortellini and eating that and feeling so nurtured and nourished because I'd done it for nobody else to taste, for nobody else to see but me. You said that the first lockdown was kind of your self-sabotage, but the second lockdown was your rebirth. In what way? Just in the sense of realising that the single most important relationship you will have in your life is the relationship you have with yourself. So why not invest and do everything you can for you to understand you than you would for somebody else? Did you find some joy in the solitude of the second lockdown? Overwhelmingly. And a lot of that, you know, was I had this incredible psychologist And in both lockdowns, our face-to-face sort of therapy sessions went digital. And I remember in the second lockdown, there was this, this moment, this defining moment where she looked at me and she said, I don't think you need me right now. And I went, I don't think I do either. (laughs) And it's about, I guess, taking those tools and realising that you can look after yourself and you can find those ways 
to just be the person you need yourself to be and hold yourself without needing someone else to. So this return to love of food, that's a big change from the girl who was eating one boiled egg a day. Exactly. And that's not to say, you know, again, grief for me, I don't want to eat and I can't eat, but it's now realising that for your brain to function, you need food. So what are those comforting things? And so that means I fill my freezer with my Pars Pesto in individual um, single lady portions, I call it. I love that single and lady so, portions. <laughs> so I pull it out of the freezer and it's there and I can have a meal that I've cooked for myself. But I suppose also the other side to that growth is that I am now allowing people to cook for me. And that is a real sort of awakening. You say in the book that sometimes you meet someone when you least expect mm-hmm. it. Tell me about the bloke who wandered into your life. You've nicknamed him the ginger. The ginger. <laughs> I suppose meeting the ginger was like falling in love with two people at the same time because for the first time in my life I could actually see myself and I was allowing someone else to see me. And I suppose, to put it bluntly, it was the first healthy relationship I've ever had and I mean that in every sense of the word. It was this mutual respect and admiration and understanding and vulnerability. It was me being so unashamedly me because I wasn't performing, I wasn't trying to be liked, I just was who I am. How did you actually meet him? We met on Tinder, of all places. But I remember I had in my profile that I was, you know, an avid reader, a food lover and something else that I can't remember, but he said, shoot, marry or kill, which one would you, which one would you do? And I loved that. Like he's he's a storyteller by nature. He's a very successful wedding photographer. And I loved his way with words. And I would say that's what sort of drew me in first and foremost. The, the first date was at your house and mm. you cooked for him. The I second did. date was at his. Yeah. You were obviously very keen, but were the feelings mutual at the beginning? Well, no. So the first date, I made him what I would probably describe as a single lady portion of ravioli, which for this giant man, he was ravenous. <laughs> He's going to need two of those single lady portions. Exactly. And I guess part of me kind of getting to that point of loving and accepting myself was that I just was no holes barred. I didn't question asking anything or saying anything. And that's not to say I was obnoxious, but I was unfiltered in the sense of just like, take it or leave it, buddy. And I remember kind of saying to him, like, let's have another date. And he was like, "Eh, I don't know if we're necessarily going to work out. And I was like, cool, no problem. See you later. And then he was like, I'm really just sad. I'm not going to be able to cook for you. And so I was like, you know where I live. And so he ended up coming over and bringing me this very questionable Otolenghi chickpea soup, which had the addition of fresh pasta and sour cream. And I remember eating it thinking, what on earth? (laughs) Yeah, it was a lot. But it was the gesture of being cooked for, and no one had sort of done that for me. But until he found out your backstory, he wasn't quite sure who you were or where you were coming from. Yeah, his nickname for me was Bougie Arsehole. (laughs) And I suppose that's because he said I was the first girl who's apartment he went to that had original artwork and nice mid-century furniture. And so I think he thought I was a trust fund baby. And that was kind of great for me because, again, I was unashamed. And I sat there and I, on the second date, told him everything unreservedly about my childhood, about my mum, about my people pleasing, about my divorce, and that everything that he saw was that I had worked incredibly hard for. How did it change things when he understood that backstory? Overwhelmingly. It was like seeing someone have wheels turn in their (laughs) eyes and I think he definitely saw me as I was from that moment. He he works as a photographer Mm. and he took some photographs for you to go with a magazine piece that you'd written. Mm. Being photographed, it it can be quite a vulnerable uh, experience. What was that like having this bloke that you quite fancied being on the other side of, of yeah. the lens. And it was it was so expository. It was so intimate. I remember he said to me, what was the lowest moment for you that you, you look back on now and you couldn't have seen where you are today? And I remember I got taken back to being in the kitchen. It makes me teary, actually. And it was one of the first times I'd made a boiled egg. And I remember it was sitting on the table threatening me. And I was at war with myself to eat it and really forcing myself to eat it. And in that moment, he took the photo. 
And seeing that photo was like I was seeing myself for the first time. Was it confronting? Hugely. By acknowledging that I was seeing myself for the first time, I was also acknowledging that I was allowing someone in and allowing someone to see me for the first time. Were you falling for this bloke by this stage? Overwhelmingly. (laughs) Were you scared of getting hurt, being so open? I was, but also, again, hopeless romantic. And I think for the first time, because of all the work that I had done, I wasn't afraid to advocate for myself. And that was something I had never really done before. And so I remember we had this date and and I said to him, right, I'm beginning to have feelings for you and I don't need an answer right now and you don't have to feel the same, but I'm just telling you, if you don't feel the same way, I'm, I'm drawing a line here and I'm protecting myself. And then we kind of left it like that, had this great date. And then a couple of weeks later he sort of came over and I was readying myself and preparing myself for the end And I remember he sat down and he looked at me and he said, I've only ever dated girls before and and you're a woman. And it was one of the most romantic things someone's ever said to me. When I was reading this, I I felt like a bit of an interfering aunt. I was cheering on the ginger. (laughs) It was was fantastic. Uh, What's the situation now? I think the best way to describe it is it's like baking a cake and you can have all of the perfect ingredients and the most fancy oven and you could be in the best possible mood and you mix it all together and you put it in and yet the batter doesn't rise. And I suppose that's kind of us, is that it's the most perfect pairing and I just wish that we'd maybe had met at a different time. It almost brings us back to where we started, this idea in the book of of heat Mm -hmm. changing things. Mm. How do you reflect on that in the moments where you've really felt the heat from life and things have been difficult? How do you think that's changed you? I honestly believe that I am who I am because of the adversities that I've faced and I wouldn't change anything. Even the ginger, you know, he ended things quite abruptly. But It showed me, and I guess each time I've been challenged in that way, just how strong I am. And it's really, I guess, for me, realising that you can be in the thick of grief and you can be holding that in one hand, but in the other you can cling to joy and one feeling doesn't take away from the other. How important do you think is the connection that food can bring with other people? Profound. And I suppose for the first time in my life I've realised I have purpose and that purpose is to connect women through food and I do that through a supper club I run at my house by, you know, eating and connecting. We all have memories that are intertwined with food. Food and feeling is something for all of us, good and bad. Basically for me is is what I see as the way to connect and be vulnerable and to have a sense of community is to feed and be fed. What do you think little girl you would think of Mm -hmm. who you've become? I think she would be really proud because so much of what I'm doing now is for her. And the fact that I've been able to write a book that has done that, you know, I don't have a relationship with my dad, but I was able to give him a copy of the book and say, there you go, catch up on the last decade of my life. That's really incredible. And the fact that as a result, women around the country are feeling seen and heard is perhaps one of the greatest things I'll ever have done. That's the younger part of you looking at who you are now. What about looking back when you look at that girl navigating what was happening in your house at that time, surrounded by love, but also surrounded by some challenges? How do you see her now? She's so small and I wish, I wish that that wasn't the case. But I know that she was doing her best and that everyone around her was doing their best. And I think that's the reconciliation and and the growth and the understanding that I have now is that I can separate my mum from her illness and I can actively appreciate her for who she is. And, you know, we just went, um, she joined me on my book tour for a week. We went to Lismore where I grew up in Byron Bay, you know, where a lot of our friends are and... It was the first trip that we did as adults together where I think she actually saw me as that adult and I could see her as that adult and we could actively appreciate each other. And that was, you know, with my pa sending me off with one of those Webster packs of like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, of all of her pills. I felt like a a mobile pharmacy. But it was extraordinary because she was actively taking them. I didn't have to remind her. We were just full of joy 
all the grief or all the pain or all those experiences or baggage aside, there is so much joy to be found in life. And my God, do I enjoy my mother. How grateful are you to your mum? Yeah, it's, she's amazing. Charlotte, thank you. Charlotte Ree is my guest on Conversations today. Charlotte's book is called Heartbake, A Bittersweet Memoir. Today's conversation will be available for you soon as a podcast and on our website. I'm Sally Sara. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. I'm Bobby McCumber, the host of a brand new podcast from ABC Radio Australia called Stories from the Pacific. The tradition of storytelling is such a huge part of life in the Pacific. Stories connect generations. Dad and I really had to learn how to be father and son. Bridge political differences. Sports can be like soft diplomacy. Record histories. It's a repetitive pattern of a man marrying and divorcing and then marrying again, divorcing. And create community. There was never a moment I felt like I didn't have the support system. Stories from the Pacific draws you deep into the lives of Pacific Islanders who have seen and done amazing things. You can find Stories from the Pacific every week on your favourite podcast app or the ABC Pacific website.